Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is John Marvel. In 1993, he co-founded a nonprofit organization, Western Watersheds Project, www.westernwatersheds.org. It was initially called the Idaho Watersheds Project to challenge the destructive business of public lands ranching, a land use that has negatively affected more of the American West than any other human activity. John retired as executive director of WWP on March 1, but continues as a WWP board member for the Sagebrush Habitat Conservation Fund, which is a fund that seeks to negotiate voluntary buyout and permanent retirement of grazing allotments in sage step landscapes across the West. The fund has already permanently retired over 140,000 acres of public lands from livestock use. So thank you so much for being for being on our program today, John. Uh, glad to be with you, Derek. Um, so, so tell me what's what? I guess two questions. What is the scale of public lands ranching in the West, and what's wrong with public lands ranching in the West? Well, uh, many people don't realize how large an area is affected by ranching. It's about 250 million acres, and it's more than any other activity affecting public lands in the entire United States. And in fact, uh, ranching of all kinds is the largest human impact in the entire world on natural ecosystems. And in most cases, it's entirely negative. Uh, There's some pecuniary benefits for ranchers But in the case of Western North America, ranching would be impossible without a rather remarkable list of government subsidies. So it's heavily subsidized, it's highly destructive, and it covers a huge territory. Uh, Some of the negative impacts are on native plants and animals that are displaced or eliminated either through human action or by loss of habitat, and uh, especially impacted our riparian zones around streams, springs, and lakes where uh, cattle uh, congregate and sheep also. So it has a huge litany of negative impacts. We can look at it in more detail if you wish. Um, Yeah, I'd love to. Um, um let's let's introduce this so you know i think a lot of people especially say in the eastern united states don't actually know that there are for example timber sales or mines on public lands they think that the lands that are in the national forest or wilderness area they think that those are basically left to be um for the the mountain lions and the wolves and the grizzly bears but uh, so can you do an introduction for, say, especially people in the eastern United States or people who live in urban areas about about what uh, the relationship between resource extraction and the, and the and public lands? Well, uh, I, I agree that uh, in many places people are unaware that national forest lands and uh, public domain lands administered by the Bureau of Land Management, which are even larger, or even the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuges, all are not truly protected landscapes and ecosystems. A whole suite of human activities is permitted on these landscapes, which are mostly located west of the 100th meridian in 11 western states in Alaska. Uh, These lands have been part of the public domain since they were purchased under the Louisiana Purchase or taken from Mexico during the Mexican War in 1848. Uh, Of course, Alaska was acquired by purchase in 1867. All of these lands are that were not homesteaded or open for various uses, mining, oil and gas extraction, uh, logging, ranching, uh, <clears throat> roads, uh, and of course recreational activities, including uh, motorized recreation, which is also quite destructive. But none of these activities exceeds in scope public lands ranching as a as a larger negative impact on other values 
ranching is by far the largest net negative on these landscapes. And since they're owned by all Americans and not just by the tiny group that use them for commercial purposes in the American West, uh, all Americans should be aware of this legacy of theirs and support protecting these more thoroughly. Okay, so I don't, I don't understand. So, so it's public lands, which means they're my lands. So do I get to run cows on them? <laughs> no, uh, you need a permit. And in order to gain a permit, which uh, in, uh, typically enables you to run cows or sheep for 10 years on a particular piece of public land in a particular season of use, depending on where in the West it's located, you would have to own a ranch. And the ranch would have to be uh, of a certain size, depending on where you are in the West. In fact, in Arizona, which is a uh, hot desert, much of it, you don't even need to own a ranch. You just need to own enough water rights to water your cattle when they're not on the public lands. And since many Arizona grazing allotments are used 12 months of the year, uh, the cattle or sheep are present year-round on those lands. So it would be a challenge for you, Derek, or many Americans, most Americans, to graze livestock on these lands, and God forbid they would want to. Okay, so let's just say that I own a ranch and um, of, of the proper size, and um, now I'm going to put my cattle on the public lands, at least... At least the feds are getting rent out of this, right? So, I mean, they pay for these permits, right? So, Well, as uh, our listeners will recall, the recent Clive Bundy affair in uh, Nevada, uh, you can even use these lands, evidently, without paying for them, which he has not done for 20 years, over hundreds of thousands of acres. But technically, ranchers are supposed to pay for the privilege to run cattle or sheep on public lands. Right now they pay $1.35 a month per 1,000-pound cow and a calf uh, or five sheep, $1.35 a month. I often speak to high school and college students, and I ask them if they own a pet. And, of course, most of them have at one time in their life been responsible for a pet, and we discover by asking and if what it costs them to feed their pet for a month. So, for example, over the years, I've learned what it costs to feed a tarantula. And uh, do you know what tarantulas eat, Derek? Uh, I'm guessing crickets or something. You are exactly right, live crickets. And the cost to feed an adult tarantula a month is about $7.00. Wow. in live crickets. Uh, even a hamster uh, will cost more than $1.35 a month or a canary. And if you have larger animals like a St. Bernard, a pony, or a horse, you're talking uh, perhaps in uh, many tens or even hundreds of dollars a month to feed that animal, and not to speak of all the other costs. And so ranchers have had this sweetheart deal for decades uh, using public lands for almost nothing, uh, the market value for these lands would be more than 20 times what they're paying per month. And uh, the government loses uh, somewhere between uh, 150 and $200 million a year just in the administrative costs over the income from the grazing fee. And that doesn't include the environmental degradation? Oh, no, that's purely an economic figure. The, uh, as usual with uh, environmental impacts that are negative, it's very difficult to quantify the value of those in terms of an annual budget. And, of course, uh, one of the most egregious parts of public lands ranching is the murdering by federal agents of predators and other wildlife every year just to benefit ranchers. Uh, more than 90,000 coyotes are killed with poison traps and from aerial gunships by federal agents every year in the American West. 
And there has been a lot of um, there have been a lot of wolves killed lately too. And um, I think we can presume that a lot of those wolves were killed. That a lot of the anti-wolf noise is made is is fomented by a lot of ranchers. I, I know you know I've lived in the West my whole life, and I lived in northeastern Nevada for a while, and I have for a couple of years, and I mean, I, I don't know that I can say this generically, but it is in my experience that um, many of the public lands ranchers that I have known or encountered have um, hated predators more than almost anyone else I've ever met. Uh, it's quite visceral. You're correct. In fact, we refer to ranching as the culture of death uh, because uh, aside from their own animals, which of course are killed ultimately, uh, they also seek to kill virtually everything that moves within their purview, especially predators, but not limited to predators. For example, even small rodents like uh, ground squirrels, uh, prairie dogs, or rabbits are routinely poisoned or gassed by ranchers because they create holes in the ground and eat grass. And so it is definitely a culture of death. Uh, killing blackbirds, uh, raptors uh, is routine in the American West on the part of ranchers. And the generalized hatred for wolves by ranchers is unexceeded by even that of uh, deer hunters and elk hunters who also often object to wolves. Uh, wolves, which kill uh, very few livestock relatively, uh, more than 80 times as many uh, cattle and sheep are, die every year from simple weather or disease issues than are killed by predators of any kind. And wolves are a tiny percentage of predator kills uh, being exceeded by uh, bears, cougars, coyotes, and other animals and even those are a tiny proportion. So it's a culture that misunderstands the human relationship with the natural world in a way that is dangerous, not only to living things, but also to other people because of the culture of violence associated with ranching. You know, and we saw that at, with the Clive Bundy affair, too. Yeah, there's a, a couple directions I want to go with this. One of them, I want to talk about the wolves again for a second, because I remember um, a couple years ago in Washington State, there was um, a huge deal because there was this one family, the McCurvin family, were um, suffering, according to the newspaper articles, quote, a grueling summer of losses. And the newspapers were just really propagandizing that um, one of the families said, we can't operate with the kind of losses we're seeing and they had 12 cattle killed or injured by wolves, they said. And um, it ends up that if you look up injured, it includes just tiny little scratches. So we don't know, actually. And then in addition, I know that this is your territory, but I just want to go on for a second, that that there was no financial loss to the ranchers, that um, Washington State will pay ranchers uh, twice market value for every wolf that gets killed. And that's for every, every cow, you mean. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. They'll pay twice market value for every cow that is confirmed to have been killed by a wolf, which suggests, of course, that from the, the rancher's perspective, if it's just an economic perspective, you'd think you'd be really glad because if I'm having a product, I would rather get twice market value for it than regular market value. But the real point I wanted to get to is they were talking about these 12 cows and saying this was this terrible, terrible loss to them. But it ends up that the McCurvins ran more than 5,000 cows. And... <laughs> So it, let's presume for a second they actually did lose 12. That ends up 0.2%. And that's a completely trivial – once again, and I'm not even going to grant them all 12 of those being honest to goodness wolf kills, but let's presume mm -hmm. they were, for which they would have been paid. Um, it's a completely trivial loss. And then in addition, the McCurvin family refused to accept any compensation. And they said, quote, the only compensation we're interested in is dead wolves. And – for me, that's, that's the whole thing right there. Well, I, I would agree completely that that's an excellent summary of the attitude of ranchers in the West. Uh, 
who are propped up by the government and uh, would go out of business without government handouts, even though they hate the government. And there are great ironies involved here. Uh, we've often uh, said to ranchers who are most aggressive about uh, disliking wolves that they should just tether their calves out in the forest or the fields of the public lands and let wolves kill them and be compensated and they'd make more money. Yeah, and and in this case, actually, what happened was um, the state of Washington killed the entire wolf pack. Um, right. Right. So let's go, let's go back to the ecological harm caused by wolves and sheep. And uh, you, you mentioned it, but can you give a bit more detail? And then also, as you're talking about it, uh, a a rebuttal I want to bring up that I would like for you to. Uh, attend to would be, well, you know that there there were megafauna on this land before. There used to be elk, and there used to be pronghorn antelope, and so what's the big deal? Or desert sheep, or whatever. So, what's the big deal? So, if you could address both the damage and that that rebuttal, that'd be great. Well, let me start with the latter first. Um, uh, the American West, west of the 100th meridian, with the exception of western Oregon, Washington, parts of northern California, a little bit of northern Idaho and Montana are very is very dry, arid country, uh, averaging less than 15 inches of rainfall a year. And therefore, the plant communities that co-evolved in this dry climate are different than those in the short grass or t mixed grass or tall grass prairies to the east or the temperate rainforests of the northwest. And in these arid, um, often sage step climax plant communities, the productivity of the landscape in terms of forage for grazers is far, far less than it would be in the Great Plains or in the eastern United States. And as a consequence, the herbivores that co-evolved with this arid landscape are not like cattle or sheep, which both of which evolved in wetter landscapes and are more water dependent. And so in no way can these landscapes be considered uh, to accept cattle and sheep as substitutes for wildlife that formerly inhabited them. That's a shibboleth of the worst kind. What co-evolved with these landscapes are the native wildlife that should be there that either have been killed or removed in other ways by habitat destruction, typically, by ranching. So the arid west is a different place than where bison lived. Primarily, there were some bison west of the Continental Divide, but not many. And most bison were existing in the mixed grass and short grass prairies further east, especially in the numbers, huge numbers we know about. Now, the impacts of cattle and sheep that are destructive include, for example, domestic sheep transferring disease to bighorn sheep for which they have no immunity, much like we transferred, we white people transferred smallpox to Native Americans, for which they had no immunity. And bighorn sheep have been extirpated over 90% of their former range because of the presence of domestic sheep. In addition, domestic sheep uh, focus on eating forbs, which are broadleaf flowering plants as opposed to grasses, when they graze. And a whole suite of native fauna are dependent on forbs and are extirpated with the forbs when sheep spend uh, decades consuming and destroying those kinds of vegetation. And the those are two of the worst aspects of sheep grazing. Now, sheep grazing is much diminished now because it's so uneconomic. Wool and mutton are not very uh, 
uh, in demand as they were 100 years ago. Now, cattle have a whole suite of other uh, conflicts and negative impacts, including, uh, and this is probably the worst thing, is the destruction of riparian areas, which are land, parts of the landscape next to streams, springs, and creeks, wettish areas or wet meadows. Cattle tend to congregate in these places and through trampling and grazing and browsing, they tend to diminish the vegetation, cause large-scale erosion, and streams become entrenched and lose their floodplain. This has happened in 90% of the arid west to a degree that many streams are not recoverable without intervention. That's probably the worst thing. Then there's displacement of other forms of life out there through trampling, ground nesting birds, for example, uh, by removing vegetation alongside streams, fish die because of water temperature increases and pollution of water through cattle wastes, both liquid and solid waste. So that's just a short uh, roundup of negative impacts that uh, we observe even to this day. Do you see? I mean, I know that the whole Clive and Bundy thing made a made a big a big uh, splash recently and was big news everywhere. And do you do you generally see um, public opinion? How do you see public opinion regarding grazing? Do you see it getting better, or do you see it getting do you see it getting more supportive of the real world, of the natural world, or do you see it getting more supportive of of ranchers? Which direction do you see it going? Or do you see it polarizing? Well, yes, I would say polarizing is the correct term, and it depends where you interview people. You get different responses. Uh, for the most part, ranchers are regarded highly by the general population as salt of the earth and uh, pioneers of the frontier and uh, hardy individuals withstanding difficult weather and and harsh landscapes to produce something for the rest of Americans. And so these uh, often media created ideas of ranching through film and television and uh, novelization continue to have some impact. Although because of the decline in interest in, for example, Western movies, uh, we don't have as much media impact that is favorable to ranchers as we had in the past when John Wayne was a American hero. I know. It's basically you're attacking John Wayne and Gary Cooper. How dare you? Well, I think uh, they're dead after <laughs> all. And so we don't really need to worry about them very much, uh, thank heavens. And uh, because they're dead, people don't even know who they are anymore. If you uh, ask anybody under the age of 40, they often don't know who those very people are that I grew up with, for example, watching films or television. And that's a good thing because uh, it cuts into that support for ranching. Uh, there is a still the culture of the rural American West where ranchers were the important people and are have been given historically deference to, and they were the ones making decisions and were the county commissioners and were on the school board and were the U.S. senators. That continues to a great extent and is true in places like Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, where the governors are all ranchers. Uh, so the cowboy myth, which was created mainly by media and has existed for about 120 years, uh, maybe 130, is slowly fading out. And when you have a uh, an extreme example like Clive Bundy putting his foot in his mouth in such a dramatic way, it undermines what remaining mythology there is, and that, in my judgment, is a good thing. Uh, that doesn't say that ranching is not still positively admired. I think that most people think highly of ranchers, but most people are not informed about the welfare 
subsidies they receive or their attitude about wildlife. If people were fully informed about how much wildlife dies because of ranching, uh, and I would include in wildlife wild horses, even though they are typically descended from rancher strays, they still are part of the landscape. And uh, ranchers uh, achieved some of their greatest excess in killing animals was when they would shoot horses, wild horses, to turn them into dog food and glue. And one of the greatest uh, Marilyn Monroe movies was about that, The Misfits. So we've been talking about some of the ranchers, but, you know, we've mentioned, you know, I mentioned the McIrvins, and then there's the Clive and Bundy. Um, but aren't there also a lot of ranchers with names like Anheuser-Busch or um, there's, I know that the the former news reporter who was fabulously wealthy, Donaldson, had a huge ranch. He was famously anti-wolf. Um, and then outside of Yellowstone with the bison, um, isn't one of the ranchers there by some, isn't one of the ranchers actually a large uh, church of some sort? Yeah, um, the church universal triumphant. Yeah. So can you tell, can you tell, I mean, so sometimes we aren't, I mean, we aren't talking about John Wayne for a couple reasons. One, I mean, can you talk about some of these corporate ranches who are just yeah. welfare cheats too? Well, they sure are, and they continue to concentrate ownership in larger uh, corporate entities in ranching. Uh, uh, 10% of the public land ranchers in the American West control almost 80% of the use out there. Uh, the Ma and Pa rancher mythology is no longer real. Uh, small ranchers barely exist anymore. And in Nevada, I'll give you a couple of good examples. Uh, the two largest ranching entities in the state of Nevada, which is the state with the highest percentage of uh, public land in the American West, excluding Alaska, are uh, Barrick Gold Corporation and the Southern Nevada Water Authority. These two entities, one a large mining company, a Canadian company, Barrick, uh, and the other a public utility for Clark County, Nevada, that provides water to Las Vegas, have been buying ranches for years all over Nevada in order to gain the water rights. And uh, for Las Vegas and the Water Authority, they want to move the water to Las Vegas. And for the gold mining company, they want the water rights to use in their gold mining uh, facilities that uh, concentrate the ore. And they need water to do that. They continue to run cattle or sheep just as a sop to local county commissioners and the politicians. Uh, and so they've become the largest ranchers in Nevada. And there's great deal of irony here because they don't even care about cattle and sheep, but they continue to do it because it's so cheap to do so. So uh, another good example of uh, corporate uh, ranching is, as you mentioned, the Anheuser-Busch Corporation that uh, makes Budweiser and other beers. And uh, they have one of the largest corporate ranching operations in the West. Another is the uh, Hilton family of the Hilton Hotel fame. Uh, Baron Hilton, the son of Conrad Hilton, uh, has a ranching empire that ap approaches millions of acres. Uh, in Idaho, we have the largest public land rancher of all in the American West, the Simplot Corporation, uh, privately owned by the Simplot family. J.R. Simplot was, until he died in 2009, a multi-billionaire with ranching as a hobby. And uh, the Simplot Corporation still runs cattle on about 3 million acres of public land in four states. This is one of the things that kills me about any of these discussions is that when it's presented in the media 
um, almost always um, it is the you know the the the, the, pers- the people they talk to are the fairly small ranchers. Um, you know, as as crazy as some of them may be. But once again, they're not even representative. When, as you say, 10% of the ranchers control 80%. It's, it's, there's a, that's, I mean, this thing is so outrageous and so destructive on so many levels, and we never even hear that fundamental fact. Oh, there's another fundamental fact, too, that I wanted you to mention, if you don't mind, is that, is that one of the arguments that's made by pro-public lands ranchers is that the price of beef will skyrocket if they were to take cattle off the West. But well, that's kind of nonsense. Can you tell me why? Uh, yes, it's complete nonsense because all of that 250 million acres that's leased for cattle and sheep grazing in the American West on public lands produces slightly over 2% of the beef produced in the United States every year. And so if it cease tomorrow, which is unlikely, uh, it would have no effect on the price of beef whatsoever. And the sheep production, uh, so few people eat lamb or mutton that it would have uh, absolutely no effect whatsoever. So that's completely untrue. Price of beef would not change. Now, of course, I would recommend people stop eating beef for many other reasons, uh, because it's part of our global warming problem is livestock production in general. And so, eating, if you must eat meat, it's much healthier to stay away from beef, whatever you think. So I want to go back to there, there's there's another another little factoid that has stuck with me ever since I read Lynn Jacobs' Waste of the West twenty some years ago or twenty years ago. Yes. And it's a it's I thought that was a great book and very important. And um, just one of the things that struck me about the difference between when you were talking earlier about how the West did not evolve with these types of creatures and cattle evolved for wetter areas. I remember him talking about fecal pavement and the difference between cow excrement and desert sheep excrement or pronghorn excrement. And is, did I make a big deal out of nothing, or is that as big a deal as it seemed when I read it? Well, it, it, it's an important ecological impact that's unexamined. Uh, cattle waste is very different than uh, pelletized waste that comes from native wildlife whether it's antelope, bighorn sheep, deer, elk, moose, uh, they have very different waste production systems in them. And cattle waste, as you know, covers large, makes large patties that cover large areas of the landscape and tends to suffocate whatever plant or animal it lands on. And so that's an unexamined negative impact uh, that is much larger than has been acknowledged. And it seems, you know, I live in far northern California on the coast, so I live in the, the rainforest you were talking about, mm-hmm. and I've seen the effects here of cow patties or of any large... There's a lot of bears here, so I see large. I see large bear poop a lot, and... In a wet place like this, it can go down, but the uh, the grass can grow through it as opposed to, or it'll get pounded down by rain pretty quickly and go into the soil as opposed to in a desert area where it could dry and take forever to go away. Yeah, it can take a decade or more for cow pies to decay and disappear in the arid west. So it is a an essential problem uh and it especially affects uh, insects and small animals. So let's talk for a minute about, we have about about eight or nine minutes left, and can we talk for a moment about the Sagebrush, Habit, Sagebrush Habitat Conservation Fund? Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. It's a nonprofit that was created four years ago, 
uh, through a deal, Western Watersheds project cut with the El Paso Corporation, a Houston-based oil pipe, oil and gas pipeline company. Uh, we agreed not to litigate their Ruby pipeline from Wyoming to uh, southern Oregon, uh, 670-mile-long, 42-inch diameter natural gas pipeline. Uh, in return, they agreed to put $15 million over 10 years into this new nonprofit, the Sagebrush Habitat Conservation Fund, for the sole purpose of acquiring federal grazing permits and having them permanently retired. And so the fund exists for that purpose. It caused a lot of controversy when it first came out uh, because uh, ranchers were upset that uh, a gas, natural gas transmission company had given money to the uh, environmentalists. But uh, we continue to run the fund and completed our first major deal last August where we bought out federal grazing permits on 140,000 acres in southwest Idaho next to Oregon and Nevada. It's difficult to do because the current uh, federal grazing system is set up to benefit ranchers and not environmental concerns, wildlife, clean water, recreational opportunities for people. And so retirement of grazing permits is harder than you would think. But in Hawaii County, we've managed to get that done in Idaho. And there are other areas, for example, in the California desert and in some national monuments where retirement of permanent retirement of grazing is permitted. And we expect that to grow over time uh, because ranching ultimately in the American West is a hobby activity. It's not an economic activity. And uh, economics is ultimately the strongest pressure that is negative for ranching because it's so ec uneconomic. And even little things could make a huge difference. Uh, a increase in the grazing fee, say, or uh, stricter environmental regulation of grazing would so diminish the importance of ranching that it would go away by itself. And we're trying to incentivize that by offering money to ranchers to give up their permits permanently and actually, we often have a bigger fight with the federal agencies, the Forest Service and the BLM, than we do with the ranchers who sometimes are tired of ranching and want to get out, and their kids have already moved to Los Angeles or Denver or wherever. And, uh, but the agencies uh, regard it as an attack on their jobs. And, well, they should because they should be looking for another job. Or, or maybe they could uh, still get paid by the federal government but actually do something good for the land instead of harmful. Well, that would be a challenge for them. They'd have to go to re-education camp, I suspect, and that might be taken in the wrong way. Yeah. You know, I when you were saying that it's hard for um, – that the that you get the opposition from the the federal agencies sometimes it reminds me of when I lived in Washington there were environmental groups would try to purchase timber sales from the federal government with the explicit purpose of not cutting the trees and they would actually pay more than the timber companies would but the forest service would routinely refuse their offers saying you can't buy these trees to keep them standing you have to buy them to cut them and that was always completely insane to me. Well, and of course, uh, I pioneered the idea of competing for state grazing leases in several states and paying much more money than ranchers. And we had to go to court repeatedly in order to do that because the system was set up to prevent uh, conservation non-use of grazing leases. And that was a big challenge. And the system is designed to thwart change, as you know, but um, I think that the value of uh, 
wildlife and wild lands and uh, unfettered uh, muscle-powered recreation is growing in the country, and these public lands are the places where those things can happen. The restoration of Western North America for wildlife and wildness is perhaps the only place in, on Earth where we can actually accomplish that, even in the face of global warming. And so I commend to our listeners the idea that the legacy of public lands in the American West is one of the single most wonderful parts of being an American. And with those public lands being restored for wildlife, whether it's wolves or desert tortoise or desert pupfish or sage grouse or antelope or bighorn sheep, all of those animals will be so much better off without cattle and sheep on these lands. If we want a museum with ranchers in it in singing uh, regional songs and western ditties and, and, and citing the cowboy doggerel for the benefit of crowds of school children, that's fine too. But we don't need them on our public lands. Well, I completely agree. And I have two questions, two questions left real quick. One of them is, so when you retire grazing lands, um, okay, you know, we recognize that these grazing lands, I mean, I'm sorry, it's these lands evolved with the, um, with somebody eating plants. So when you retire grazing lands, how do you, or anyone else, how do you encourage the pronghorn antelope or the elk or whomever was there originally, how do you encourage them to return? Well, we actually don't need to because they return almost immediately. Uh, because the habitat situation of the vegetation community changes so much for the better within a short period of time. And what we see is the wildlife returns without a problem especially if there's any within even a few hundred miles. And they find these places without livestock. One of the best examples is the Hart Mountain National, Wild, uh, National Antelope Refuge in eastern Oregon, where cattle have been removed in their entirety, no livestock grazing at all since 1993. And the antelope population there is at its highest ever level, the same for sage grouse there. And in the past, the Fish and Wildlife Service had purposefully been gunning down coyotes to try and save the few antelope fawns they had, and now they don't need to do that anymore because there's plenty of hiding cover, and the coyotes and antelope are in balance. So it's basically like when you take out a dam and then Two weeks later, you see salmon nosing their way upstream. And I was at the Elwha Dam on the Olympic Peninsula just a year ago seeing that exactly that happen. And so uh, these landscapes can recover. Now, there are some places where they've been beat up really badly, but in general, in western North America, the recovery of public lands to benefit wildlife, wildness, and human muscle-powered recreation is greatest, greater than anywhere else in the world. And that's the vision that keeps me motivated. So my last question is um, just sort of a, a wrap-up. So people have heard this, and they, they, they hear what you say, and perhaps it surprises them, perhaps it doesn't. What do you want people to do with this information, whether they live in New York City or whether they live in Idaho? Uh, there are several things they can do. First, they can contact their representative and senators and say, raise the grazing fee. We don't need welfare ranching. That's a simple thing they can do and get their friends to do. Uh, second, they can visit these lands and advocate for them as the wonder wonderful places they are. Uh, third, they can join groups like the Western Watersheds Project and others who fight for wildlife and wildness on our public lands in the American West and help support them financially. So those are some of the things I'd recommend uh, 
we have a political problem out there and we need uh, our Congress to address the grazing fee issue. It would help if President Obama would do something about it too, but he seems lost when it comes to environmental issues. Right. Well, thank you so much for your work and thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank people for listening. My guest today has been John Marvel. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.